Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Golden Lion Press and Ricochet Edition's third event of our 2 by 2 reading series, Writing the Surreal. As some of you may already know, Golden Lion and Ricochet are sibling presses at the University of Southern California with different aesthetic traditions. Over the years, the presses have transformed with new PhD students in creative writing and literature, fulfilling editor roles at both presses every year. The 2 by 2 reading series is our way of blending our press's evolving identities, celebrating the spectacular authors we've had the great fortune of publish, uh, publishing over the years, and building connections with other community organizations that share our literary values. Now, before we move on, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the editors for these teams. Uh, for Ricochet, we have Laura Roque, distribution editor. I want to raise your hand. There you go. Thomas Rangelian, editorial editor. Matt Kessler, publicity editor. And Tisha Marie Raiki Aguirre, managing editor. At Goldline Press, we have myself, nonfiction editor Marcus Clayton, uh, Sarah Featheroff, our poetry editor, who unfortunately could not make it to the event today due to illness. We all wish her well. Um, Jocelyn Takix, our fiction editor, and Mary Lang, editor-in-chief. Yes. So a few accessibility notes about today's event. One, three of us will be live captioning the event, so please refer to the closed captioning button on your Zoom screen for subtitles. You can click show subtitles and view full transcription to follow along. Two, we plan to upload the video to YouTube after the event with subtitles so you can view the reading again at home and share with everyone. After the reading, we'll have a Q&A and time for audiences to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom webinar at the point to ask your questions. Right. Today's reading and discussion explores the, tr the transformative and malleable landscape of the surreal. From works that synthesizes divinity and pop culture to pieces that explore the ethereal and heritage. Readers Elisa Slaughter, F.J. Bergman, Jane Wong, and Dexter Booth will share poetry and prose that complicate the very idea of form and ask the reader to interact with the work beyond the confines of the normative text. The Q&A after the reading will be hosted by Vicky Vertis, author of Palm Fronds with its Throat Cuts, a poetry collection that resists convention, champions code switching and transformation, and allows the mutation of form to, pre to prevent histories from being forgotten. So I'd like to now properly introduce today's moderator, Vicky Bertis is the oldest child of an immigrant Mexican family. She was born and raised in Bell Gardens along the Los Angeles River. Her first full collection of poetry, Palm Fronds with its Throat Cut, was published in the Camino de Sol series by the University of Arizona Press and won the 2018 Penn American Prize for Poetry. She lives in Los Angeles. Thank you for being with us today, Vicky. Thank you for having me, Marcus, um, and thank you to Ricochet and Goldline and all the students um, and workers at USC. I come to you from occupied Tangva, Gabrielino, and Chumash territory, also known as Los Angeles, uh, a day after the 50th anniversary of the Chicano moratorium against the Vietnam War, in the middle of so many things burning down, in the middle of so many of us uh, trying to protect one another from harm and the harms of white supremacy. So just um, I'm here with you in that spirit and uh, really glad to see you all and really honored to be here with you. So let's begin with our first reader who I'll introduce. Um, Elisa Slaughter's book of short stories, Bad Habitats, won the Goldline 2012 Fiction Chapbook Competition. She's also published fiction and creative nonfiction in several literary journals, including Santa Monica Review, The Missouri Review, Natural Bridge, Alimentum, and online and at various other places. She lives in the mountains of Southern California. So please welcome Elisa Slaughter. Thanks to Goldline for the, uh, for the invitation and greetings to my family in Oregon if they managed to log on. Thanks to my nephews for managing that. Um, I'm gonna read Bad Habitats, the title story. Uh, the Party Skunks of the South Bay. When the conventions come to town, there's chicken sometimes, 
sandwich shards among the square planters and the white trunk ficus, reflecting pools that reflect and colored jets that fling chlorine drops of amethyst and amber. Maybe it's the disinfectants or whatever they're feeding the chicken, but we can't think straight. The skunks totter past, delicate and soft limbs, but get closer and it's evident there's something wrong with those girls. Raccoon, they used to say, back when they could still make jokes. Raccoon, go down to Belmont Pier and tell me those aren't plastic bags in the water. And we've forgotten now why that seems so funny. Considering our position, we're unusually sensitive to current events. We've tried a lot of strategies and gone so far as to hire consultants, but we've started to believe all kinds of things. We've started to feel something in common with what we formerly derided. Raccoon gets his feelings hurt. He disappears down the storm drain, almost too fat to fit when the headlights sweep by. He grins wide and sly. Raccoon considers himself a product of nature, but like the rest of us, he's dizzied by something, the insecticide-soaked cockroaches he throws down like peanuts every night. He keeps company with the worst kinds of feral cats, the addled possums and insomniac mockingbirds of 3 a.m. All afternoon, he sleeps in a tree and farts like a real degenerate. That's his problem, no follow through. And we tried to work around it, but eventually we had to say something because when someone is that important to the whole operation, when no one else can make sense of the latest email from human resources or the fine print on the 401k, we'd rather risk some hurt feelings if it means keeping the usual victims from doing the usual flat on the asphalt victim thing. Raccoon's no idiot. He gets this expression on his face, his put upon smarmy look, and there's some fear too, because as we pointed out, Raccoon isn't 100% himself. Things were fine, then it all went to hell. We lived how we could, below the berms and on the traffic wise. Fragile stalks of wild radish supported our cocoons. We breathed diesel exhaust through the silken bundle, and then one day we burst through. This place is no stranger to bucket and blade, the dregs of cement from the hopper. Rules exist, but they can't cover everything. No fair to expect that they'll answer every question. What shall we do with this? Dump it in the weeds, the rain will wash it away, draw it down to the aquifer. Crisis mode. Whatever blew ashore sent the seagulls inland where they wheel over the Eastland Mall and the thousands of naked bears clutching the wheels in their purring boxes. We creatures of habit and habitat under mackerel cloud and frail palms spray whitewash on the weeds. We shake the empties behind the Serbian Brotherhood and line up for a handout at St. Mary's Star of the Sea. The truth is that raccoon and all those cats are a real problem, more trouble than help some days. They make all of us look bad by shitting and getting into things. But much as we try to escape it, we always agree to collective guilt around here. The blurred composite on the wanted poster, a dozen traumatized witnesses. We take comfort in this. It's still a civil society. Nobody crowbars up the sidewalks to pave their patios. And when some enterprising bandit steals the pipes or the wire to sell for scrap, they dress the part. They have a clipboard and a counterfeit work order and check in at the front desk. After things go dark or the puddles spread, the out of order signs appear on clean paper, eye level and square jawed. Even the frauds and the disasters get a protocol. Who gets the bees? There aren't as many of them, and on our bad days, we start to think the illusion of competence is just that, that no one gets it. No one sees how everything eventually comes back to us, what breaks down and what holds up. Nobody leaves early so the staff can clean up properly. No one considers how they're fouling the nests, 
the accidents that will shred the protocols. We have materials for which we have no forms. Mockingbird sings it all, but she's tired of telling the same story over and over. We don't know if Raccoon just got sick of it all and hopped the bus, or if there was something sinister, something to Mockingbird's hints about the parking lot sweeper. The new sign that reads, it's your parking lot, let's keep it clean. Mockingbird composes in her own way her own ragged blues of cement labyrinths, crushed kittens that look like tiny foxes from a horrified distance, the silent owls of fate. She's not nocturnal by nature. She suffers from insomnia in a way we can't understand. Suffering as we do from so many things, but never from our beloved stars and street lamps. It's an urban life, all right, and it should be exciting. But they never warn you, Mockingbird, that survival is a habit like any other. Bad company at the edges, things that could go wrong so quickly, it's best to watch and sing and grab whatever flies by. What would we do if some real specialist showed up, a rare refugee with finicky tastes? Form finds its material in its own good time. No one means any malice by it. The trucks and bulldozers show up, blade the mustard and the wild radish, the sea heather and the chaparral, sink beams into the ground, deep foundations that puddle up in the winter rains. One after another, they appear in white hard hats, trace their blue lines on rolled paper, or consider the glowing blue screens of silver machines. For the lizards among us, a pile of rocks means the world. A thicket of scrub is Mardi Gras for Mockingbird. If we could find Raccoon, if we could bring him back here, pay him whatever he asked, guilt him into helping us, we'd issue a manifesto on what hatches and sprouts. We'd ask you to leave it alone. We'd enumerate the fields of grim deportation and the damp trails of mist. What's really important? What disappears as the sun comes up, the bonfire embers cool, the warning boy ho hoots its last across the bay. Thank you. Excuse my finger, you'll be seeing it <laughs> throughout the, the reading. Thank you so much, Elisa. Our next reader is F.J. Bergman. F.J. edits poetry for Mobius, the Journal of Social Change, and again temporarily at Starline, and imagines tragedies on or near exoplanets. Her most speculative work appears irregularly in Abyss and Apex, Analog, Asimov's SF, and elsewhere in the alphabet, a dystopian collection of first contact expedition reports, a catalog of the further suns won the 2017 Golden Blind Press Poetry Chapbook Contest and the 2018 SFPA Elgin Chapbook Award. Please welcome FJ. Hi, I'm glad to be here. The first three poems are from that chapbook. Xeno Aesthetics. In their language, the word for poet was troublemaker. The word for artist heretic. Any ornamentation, artifice for its own sake, was blasphemy. And even adjectives and adverbs were highly suspicious. They permitted no embellishments to lard their lean truths. We had difficulty justifying our Baroque embroideries, not to mention the floral enamel work decorating our pressure suits until one of our entomologists had the idea of explaining Batesian mimicry and camouflage. Our rollicking ballads and body limericks caused even more perturbation. But when we explored their busy marketplaces, starved eyes followed us everywhere, and delicate world ears strained to swivel toward our songs. Cultural climate. At the centers of frozen lakes, 
they built crystal palaces of ice to demonstrate their faith that climate was immutable. The study of paleontology and geology was outlawed. Apostates were flung into glacial rifts and moulins. But certain academics concealed ancient records and core samples, pretended to elicit but winked at affairs in storage closets to mask proscribed instruction. Long after no laws could conceal the cascades of meltwater or dwindling snows, it was still fashionable in those shrinking glassy realms to burn the wood of forest upon lost forest in suspended cages of black iron, to pretend to shudder with cold. Xenotheology too. On that planet, they had learned to distrust their omens. Miracles hung in the sky and manifested from the land and seas around them daily. But they all kept to themselves and their appointed tasks as if they were stone blind and deaf, even though our sensors easily detected their racing pulses penetrated their masked temblers. When our glittering ship floated low over what had been the glory of their capital city, our star drive harmonics chiming from its fused ruins, not one of them looked up. These are from elsewhere. Tech support for the apocalypse. Hello, how may I help you? Assuming, of course, you can be helped. Are you updated on all viruses? Why do you think your dreams are infected? I'm just going through the motions. Everybody has nightmares about red dust these days. Like I just do what they tell me to which is probably for the best. Ask me what it means to be overqualified. I fondly remember the days when the internet fit on a floppy disk or the world in a sugar cube. But enough of me. You are experiencing some difficulties, no? Now would be a good time to stock up on booze and bullets. Don't ever change your brand of poison. She said, not if I was the last human on earth. I don't want to die a virgin. I don't want to die. I'm afraid I can't divulge my physical location. A grid of light plays upon the smoking upholstery of an ergonomic office chair. We were a big glowing spot on their star charts, even from 20 light years out. The psychic screams of their motherships entering the heliosphere. At least we still have each other, darling. Pay no attention to those black discs coming in low from the southeast. Personally, I wear earplugs. I can't hear a word you're shrieking. This poem is after Another poem all about death by W.D. Earhart. UFOlogy. You don't want me to talk about UFOs, but I'm going to tell you anyway. First, you have to know that I've seen them, or at least their traces. Pale contrail streaming across sleepless nights, lit with an unearthly radiance, and entities emerging from metal disks. Second, I felt their heaviness on my chest in the dark, pinning me firmly, terror-stricken to the mattress as a warm rush of blood muttered urgently in my ears. Gray as smoke, they spoke in all four of the languages I knew, with less than perfect accents and limited vocabularies, wanted me to relay messages, important ones if I remember correctly. Third, this terra firma is not an only world. Stars beyond number are orbited by planets whose existence has been confirmed, 
in their turn spied upon by alien eyes, antennae, incomprehensible organs of perception. Fourth, even the data they harvest is beyond understanding. I felt them count the bones of my spine, the whorls on my left thumb, the hairs on the back of my neck, then perform calculations upon whose results depend the survival of our race. I believe race is what they said. Perhaps the word was essence of being, or maybe even souls. I got the impression they hadn't entirely mastered whichever language it was they were speaking. Survival could have been always, or even eternity. A simpler time, when differences of opinion could easily be settled by pistols at moonrise loaded with silver. I have one more short poem, but I don't know if we have time for it. Let me know if you'd rather I save it for the end or not at all. I think we're at about time. Is that okay, FJ? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I will be asking myself, um, why do you think your dreams are infected for a long time? That's amazing. Thank you. Our next reader is Jane Wong. Jane Wong's poems can be found in places such as the Best American Non-Required Reading 2019, Best American Poetry 2015, American Poetry Review, Agni, Third Coast, New England Review, and many others. Her essays have appeared in McSweeney's, Black Warrior Review, Ecotone, The Common, and This is the Place, Women Writing About Home. She is a Kundiman Fellow, Kundiman Forever. We love Kundiman in this house. She is the author of Over Poor from Action Books 2016 and How Not to Be How to Not Be Afraid of Everything, which is forthcoming from Alice James in 2021. She's an assistant professor of creative writing at Western Washington University. Please welcome the fabulous Jane Wong. Thank you so much, Vicky, for that intro. Hi, um, and thank you to Muriel for the inv invitation. Um, and it's so great to read with Dexter and Elisa and FJ too. So thank you all so much. Um, the first poem I'm going to be reading um, is actually the, the last poem of my um, forthcoming book, um, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything. And it's called After Preparing the Altar, the Ghost feverishly and this is for my ancestors who um, were lost during uh, China's Great Leap Forward in which I basically imagine them having a giant party and they eat whatever the hell they want. <laughs> so um, after preparing the altar the ghosts feast feverishly and it begins with a quote from the incredible Audre Lorde which is how hard it is to sleep in the middle of a life. After preparing the altar, the ghosts feast feverishly. We wake in the middle of a life hungry. We smear durian along our mouths, sing soft death a lullaby, carcass breath, arrows of licked fingers, and the finest perfume. What is love if not rot? We wear the fruits tall as a spiked crown, grinning in green armor, death to the grub fat in his milky shuffle, death to the lawlessness of dirt, death to mud and its false chocolate, to the bloated sun we want to slice open and yoke all over the village. We want a sun-drenched slug feast, an omelet loosening its folds like hot jello. We want the marbled fat of steak in all its swirling pink galaxies. We want the drool, the gnash, the pluck of each corn kernel raw in summer swell. Tears welling up oil, order up pickled cucumbers, piled like logs for a fire, like fat limbs we pepper and succulent in. Order up shrimp chips curling in a porcelain bowl like subway seats, grapes peeled from bitter bark, almost translucent like eyes we would rather see. Little girl, what do you leave leaven in your sight? 
death to the open eyes of the dying here. There are so many open eyes, we can't close each one. No, we did not say the steamed eye of a fish. No eyelids fluttering like no butterfly wings. No purple yam lips. We said eyes, still and resolute as a heartbreaker. Look, does this break your heart? We don't want to be rude, but seconds, please. Want, globes of oranges swallowed whole like a basketball, or Mars, or whatever planet is the most delicious. Slather Saturn, ferment Mercury, lap up its film of dust, seconds, thirds, fourths, meat wool, a bouquet of chicken feet, a garden of melons monstrous in their bulge, prune back nothing. We purr in this garden. We comb through berries and come out so blue. Little girl, lasso tofu, the rope slicing its belly clean. Deep fry a cloud so it tastes like the bitter gourd or your father leaving, the exhaust of his car charred. Serenade a snake and slither its tongue into yours and bite. Love, love, what is love if not knotted in garlic? Child, we move through graves like eels, delicious with our heads first, our mouths agape, our teeth, little needles to stitch a factory of everything made in China. You ask, are you hungry? Hunger eats through the air like ozone. You ask, what does it mean to be rootless? Roots are good to use as toothpicks. You, how can you wake in the middle of a life? We shut and open our eyes like the sun shining on tossed pennies in a forgotten well. Bald copper, blood, you choy bolts into roses down here. While you were sleeping, we woke to the old leaves of your backyard shed and we ate that. And then we ate one of your lost flip-flops too. In a future life, we saw rats overtake a supermarket with so much milk, we turned opaque. We wake to something boiling. We wake to wash dirt from lettuce to blossom into your face, aphids along the lashes. Little girl, don't forget to take care of the chickens squawking in their mess and stench. Did our mouths buckle at the sight of you devouring slice after slice of pizza in the greasy box chew? Does this frontier swoon for you? It's time to wake up. Wake the tapeworm who loves his home. Wake the ants and let them do -si do a spoonful of peanut butter. Tell us, little girl, are you hungry, awake, astonished enough? Oh, that's actually a lot to read. I have to drink some water. <laughs> um, continuing with some more food. Um, uh, these next few poems uh, are a kind of a dreamscape in which um, I have a, a dream daughter, it kind of takes place in the, the near future. Dream daughter with onions. My dream daughter is chopping onions. She has been chopping for hours, slipping off the skin like tea colored lingerie, slicing them thinly like the rings of some beloved planet. As she chops, she nudges them to the side, a growing mound of interlocking circles, measuring the wide circumference of herselves. With each onion beheaded, her hair grows sweaty in the sharp armpit smell, with a stinging sweetness in the tempered center, each long strand of hers unraveling behind her two large ears like mine, gramophone-worthy, queen-worthy. I look at her wayward strands dangling like lampshade poles, and I pull at my own willowing hair, for who doesn't desire beauty you can call your own? Did you know, I tell her, that back in the day, onions used to make people cry? That sometimes, and she stops me right there, her hand held high with her knife, shining like a winning moon, and says gently, dirt loosening each bulb, let's keep bad men out of this poem, and she just keeps chopping. Um, okay, another dream daughter. Dream daughter as idiom watering. I wake to deer shitting, Blackberry pellets, steaming mounds, all croak and bush. Guy lawn, crispy chewed, roots matted and mangled in dripping dirt. My dream daughter's wrung out hair, watering the pity crops. I woke to the garden slewing side to side, sludge of sputtered squash and plum fallen cheeks pelting the crimson ground. Everything is a mess, I whelp, split plea plummeting, my chin anchoring into myself, into what came before. Bridges collapsing at once, Bruto bellow backed. Do not open that door. Do not walk at night alone. Do not mouth your open wide. That look down up, they say, a growing daughter is smuggled salt. Say, that's my girl, my comfort, my thing that whistles want, want. Better lock up your daughter's mother's daughter. Locked in what world I feeble sprout my fear. Pigs snout stink of surrender. I can't help it. But my dream daughter reroots me, 
watering her hair, watering the puckered pumpkins rind of some furious fecund elsewhere. Watch her weave a spider into each hollow. And just this last one here um, called Overgrown. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for listening and I'm looking forward to um, our discussion afterwards too. Overgrown. The garden in which we kiss all the beetles, silver and stupid. The garden in which leaves simmer in oxtail broth and chili oil so thick it becomes a kind of leather. The garden in which we kiss all slow spit and basil tongue and rosemary brow and I can no longer be orderly. The garden in which the marrow of memory melts and hisses into a scallion scented walk. The garden in which you never left, we were never leaving, in which an imprint in fog was not a shadow shouldered in mid rib ache. The garden in which I am a pond monstrous, my mouth devouring weed puckered water, algae caught between the ladders of my teeth. The garden in which we list so closely, our ears grow ears. The garden in which my grandmother plucks carrots from their leafy tails, each clownish tuber breaking so easily she laughs down to their wrinkled toes. The garden in which spiders knit a telephone, whispering the future, the future to each other. The garden in which my brother spoons a fly out of his cereal bowl, wings awash in sweet glue. The garden in which no one asks, are you sure, or what did he ever do to deserve, or what's the context? The garden in which sunflowers wave their heads, heavy with seeds we crack and whistle back and forth. The garden in which my dream daughter sees her reflection in the frog-footed pond and thinks I look exactly like my mother, who looks exactly like my mother, and so on and so on. The garden in which we never left home, in which we never left home. The garden in which we repeat what we must, packed fractals of dahlias. The garden in which I nursed blackberry brambles back to life, for this is how bad it got. The garden in which my mother cradles me close, her jade bracelet clanging against my xylophone rim, singing, this heart I made. The garden in which I am not made to stand in the corner for years, arms strapped behind my back, legs loosening a sorrow, asking what cruelty makes silence run through me like an eel. The garden in which we lick the stink of a wound. The garden in which ladybugs pour out of a water pitcher, little rubies gulfing aphids. The garden in which I peel fibers petal after petal and find all my lost vocabularies inside of an artichoke heart. The garden in which I caress my own face because it is the face of my mother and her mother and her mother and so on. The garden in which all our ghosts lie down next to each other in the dust, heavy with rice and caramelized onions, lips dripping with the stalactites of sugar and salt. The garden in which I wrap all my loves in the capes of onion skin. The garden in which we rewrite our histories, ink pouring forth our names, our names glistening kaleidoscope of knowledge along the ancient gummy mouth of a tortoise. The garden in which I spin the algae in my teeth into a net to carry us to safety. The garden in which we let grow that which grows taller than us. The garden in which I carry the soft intestines of our survival. The garden in which the spiders, they telephone again, and they say, stay, stay. The garden in which we have whatever we want because we deserve it. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and curse and say fuck yeah. That's right. You're right. Thank you for your your furious second elsewhere, Jane. That was amazing. I feel changed. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, our next reader surely will change us to Dexter Booth. Booth is the author of Scratching the Ghost from Grey Wolf Press as well as the chapbook Rhapsody from Upper Rubber Boot Books. Booth received his PhD in creative writing from USC and is the residential, uh, and is residential English faculty at Paradise Valley Community College. He also teaches poetry in the Ashland University MFA program. Booth is currently a contributing editor for Waxwing Journal and his second collection of poetry, Abracadabra Sunshine is, is forthcoming from Red Hen Press in 2021. Please welcome Dexter Booth. Hi, everybody. Um, I want... Can you hear me? Am I good? Okay. Um, I want to start very quickly by thanking Goldline and Ricochet for having me here, and also thanking um, Elisa and Jane and FJ. Um, it's an honor reading with you all. I'm going to read just two poems here um, that are from a project that I'm currently working on. The first poem, the title of the poem just rolls right into the poem. The choir sings as Porky Pig 
sits next to a boy in the street, meets lunch from a picnic basket on a checkered blanket, the color of niggas blood. The neighborhood watch volunteer made sure a boy is just a body now. The scattered crows return and bow their heads, not to pray thanks for this meal. No, they won't take the body's flesh into their beaks, nor lick the crusted wounds. But the pig cleans his entire face with his tongue until all evidence of breadcrumbs is gone. That's all, folks. He who grows tired of cliches should avoid 30s cartoons and the evening news. No jail time for cop who shot unarmed black man. Operation Ghetto Storm. Another unarmed black teen shot and killed. Every gun is a toy. All the dead boys are pretending. The bullets are crazed canines. Freeze while the articulated ham exits the scene to sell his gun to the highest bidder. Tell the media the Guggenheim wants to place it behind glass, preserve it like a mother's memory of her only son. The murder lifts the boy. The murder buries the body beneath the echo tree. Pretend this show is not a rerun, that we aren't shot for syndication. Another cartoon in which the dead won't stay. Come back. Say it three times loud as gunshots. Boy. 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 Um, the second poem I'm going to read is um, it's just the first section of a much longer poem. Um, entitled Glasses, Crows, Recounting of Being Filled with the Spirit. My brothers, I swear I saw two angels guarding the gates to the hood. El Haj Malik El Shabazz with his burner, Huey Freeman, his flame and sword. Liberty, my brothers, the world ends with liberty, a poof of lemongrass from a sow pink's prophecy of bell and mouthpiece of bone, what I saw dwelling in the house of Alegba, hail fire and blood roasting of trees, of grass, moldering mulberry, then umber and ebony beneath the bare feet of comedians, clutching the heads of politicians, wandering the viscera of churches. I witnessed Uncle Tom and Uncle Sam sharing bowls of greens, fingers stained with the juice and pulp, democracy, Alice Coltrane at the altar, braiding the devil's beard. We are, said Gwendolyn, each other's harvest. Chorus, till, till, till. And black children in the pews, harmonizing bridges over troubled water, shoe polish and tar walls, hotter than the roof of a white man's mouth, hotter than the mouth of a white man's gun, hot as the potato of this race, war for the spirit of this stolen land. My brothers, I swear I saw a governor in blackface moonwalking through pews, feet squeaking through the blood of Katrina victims. I felt a whoop coming on, but I swallowed it when the mother touched me when the preachers pass by carrying their own eyeballs in their palms, chanting, behold the invisible, thy will be done, O Lord, I see all, know all, tell all, cure all. One whispered, you shall see the unknown wonders. So I followed them into the rain where black mothers were kneeling on the lawn of the White House, a second line glaring Dixie in the distance. Oh, what must the lawn have been thinking feeling spilled wine from the senator's skull cups. My brothers, I swear, eyes opened in the earth, newborn deities in new coops, fresh ice, chains and adidas, all white. Our gods pulled knives and disemboweled each other, stretched their entrails across the lawn to the mouth of the White House, 
the leader waiting with his double helix crown, osseous tissue, bone drone. And he levitated over the garnet rug, feet above everyone, forked tongue, preening baby fingers, negligent to the Confederate toilet paper, clutching his shoe. And as he passed the mothers, he licked each one on the forehead. Oh, brothers, I'm choking on the spirit. I feel it fiddling through the vinyl records of my heart crate. I swear. I swear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dexter. It was really moving. It's really powerful. Um, thank you all for sharing your work, um, for showing us um, how to behold the invisible. And um, this is the, the roundtable discussion part of our time together. Um, I have some questions that we generated previously, um, but after the, the roundtable, there will be time for our Q&A. Um, and um, folks from Ricochet um, or from USC, is there a way that you would want people to ask those questions via the chat? in the Q&A section at the bottom of the webinar. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, um, so given, so I was taking notes while everyone was reading um, to ground our conversation in, in both the, the, the soundscapes that you created for us in your writing, but also in the body. And what my body was telling me to ask you about is how writing can make trouble. So one of our questions is, and so this is for the, the panel, the whole panel, so any of you can answer, welcome all of you to answer this. Um, uh, and I'm gonna say his name wrong, but I try not to. Amy Césaire, a black Caribbean writer writing in French, has described surrealism as a method for liberation and quote, a weapon that exploded the French language, unquote. What relationship do you see between surrealism and decolonization or liberation in your own work? What relationship do you see between surrealism and decolonization or liberation in your own work? A giant question, <laughs> start off easy. <laughs> Or what does that make you think of? Maybe the question is not something that you can answer, but what does that? I love how Elisa, you just totally said, like, you better answer this question, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm, I feel like one of my students where I'm just kind of like, I'll just not unmute myself for a while. Um, that's such a great question, Vicki, and it's one that, yeah, is incredibly massive. But I mean, I think a big part of it is that, you know, uh, so much of whatever the real world is, um, is surreal in its own fucked upness. And so I think, I, I honestly feel like kind of the surreal worlds that, you know, I create, like, you know, my ancestors having um, a giant party where they start eating flip-flops and pizza, um, you know, because their real world was starvation, um, you know, back in like, you know, 1958 and they did, that was what was real. Um, to me, that's absurd. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, the Maoist campaign that led to that. And so I think that for me, when I'm writing the things that feel surreal, um, very much feel real. And, and I, I think they necessarily have to be real. Like I feel comforted by them. I feel like this should be what's the reality. Um, I can't help but when I'm writing um, these newer poems about this kind of like near future with this daughter that I don't have, um, I am trying to stay in this space of like what could be possible if I could imagine a world that is full of safety um, and joy, but still in those poems, I'm still fearful. I, I can't, it, it still sneaks in. Um, but maybe that's a way to answer it. I just kind of want to, you know, as 
as a kind of future ancestor, but also, you know, the, the child of ancestors, like create a, a surreal realness that is something that, you know, is maybe um, more gentle, more tender than what came before um, and what will um, come. So I feel, I feel like that's maybe um, a way to answer that as a means of kind of decolonizing the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What is possible? The what is possible? Do other folks have, have thoughts or have thoughts now that Jane has spoken about what she said or? And can you repeat the question again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a big question, but I feel like we're kind of moving toward like what, what is possible in the surreal for you? Um, yeah, maybe that's a good place to kick off now from that okay. bigger question around decolonization because it feels uh, like this massive thing. But. I'm going to attempt to answer your question, but I might get way off track. Um, what I'm working on now is a collection of poems that are, in effect, a three-act minstrel show. Um, and so I'm really looking at not just the sort of textbook history of um, Africans and African Americans in America, but I'm looking at their culture, I'm looking at their stories, I'm looking at um, what they believe prior to coming here, the sort of things that have been um, suppressed over time. And I'm looking at their existence to find moments of subversion. And so um, one example for me is um, the laughing barrel, which if anyone doesn't know, there would be these barrels along the plantation that were sort of filled with water. And um, slaves were told not to laugh. Like slave masters often thought if, if slaves were laughing, they would be laughing at the slave master, right? And so they wanted to dehumanize them and take all their joy. And the slaves um, would use these laughing barrels. They would run over to these barrels, put their head in the water, and just laugh into the water. Mm -hmm. If they had any reason to laugh, if they just suddenly felt joy. And this idea that you could feel that kind of joy um, under those circumstances of oppression and dehumanization is surreal to me. Um, and so I think from the moment that Africans arrived in America, the experience of being African and African American in America was surreal. Um, and so I'm, I'm working with these things that I think that we've sort of distanced ourselves from. So in the mm -hmm. poems that I'm working with, I'm looking at um, these stories that have come from Africa, but I'm also thinking about things that are very much American. So um, the minstrel show and the sort of cartoons that we watch every day have distanced ourselves from and have forgotten um, are connected to minstrelsy. So Mary Melodies, for example, Disney, for example, the white gloves that Mickey Mouse wears is like, that's, that's a part of the outfit of minstrelsy. Um, and so what I'm writing is pretty heavy, but I think um, pulling from the sort of pop culture element that is also connected to the suppression is a way for me to take the surreal and, and try to be subversive with it while also not being sort of overwhelmingly um, crushed by it. I think. Right, like how to continue to be, how to, how to live in, in the body given the circumstances, right? Which goes back to your original question of, you know, how do, how do, how did people, how do people, how do we have joy under these circumstances that we're living in? And particularly black people on a plantation. Absolutely. Yeah, the surreal, like none of this should be real, but it is for some of us, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, do our other writers want to comment on um, what the surreal makes possible for them? What it does for me is to enter uh, a universe where there are infinite redos, as it were, but where I, I am always afraid that humans, and for that matter, non-humans, will continue to make the same mistake with uh, every everyone everything they encounter that's different uh the the entire gold line press book of, of mine is um reports from first contact expeditions which reiterate kind of the litany of of various types of colonialism and how all those um contacts can go wrong uh, 
both the the exploitative and the well-intentioned and i i'm afraid as um someone who focuses mainly on science fiction that we're going to keep on making the same kind of mistakes and that all those mistakes are reflected in how we interact with other people on this planet who aren't like us or who don't believe quite the same things we believe. Makes me think of reincarnation, but Elisa has something to say. I just want to echo all of this. I mean, I write about in my in the book. I write about animals, and it's hard for an animal to be anything but poor and defenseless. And I have animal characters who are making a lot of money, but they're still defenseless. And I'm thinking, you know, a child is the definition of a defenseless being. And I think that being a child is a surreal position. Right? It's a surreal status. Um, I think that's why children just when they watch cartoons, they just believe that the animals are real. You know, it's not a surreal situation for them to watch an animal. The animal is real. And, and that to me is one of the powers of, of this kind of writing. I mean, that makes me think of imagination and it makes me think of the cartoons that I grew up watching that Dexter is talking about and referencing in his work, right? The, um, and in like in creating bondage, somebody had to imagine that. And so children have to imagine other ways of being because what they're in is flat, but sometimes it's not flat or sometimes it's not healthy or safe. And so we, we, we um, find refuge in imagination and in thinking the otherwise, right? The, the fear is second elsewhere, right? And for children, it's, um, I see actually, interestingly, a lot of agency in children through the imagination and what can be possible, right? Um, I have this friend from Maywood, California, who grew up in a house with eight, seven siblings, so eight total. And she had a sheet that she could pull around her bed in some way. And that was the world that she created for herself, like her privacy, right? So there's a resourcefulness I think actually children have um, that I find uh, a wonder and a, a beautiful thing. Um, thank you for your, your responses there. Um, so you have a few more minutes for a couple more of our previously written questions. Um, so here's something that is interesting that I thought we would talk about. Um, the aesthetics described as and canonized as realism often arise from and support interpretations of the world rooted in whiteness and colonization or white Western thought. I would also say patriarchy. How does your work seek to challenge ideas about realism? Let's start there. And we've kind of, these are all related, but. Or maybe it makes you think of something. All that's fair. How does your work seek to challenge ideas about realism? Um, for me, so uh, I think D. D. Scott Miller wrote the Afro Surrealist Manifesto. And in that, he said that others, quote, others, people who are other, um, who create from their lived experience are surrealists by the nature of that experience. Um, and so for me, I think that that's, that's my answer, is that my lived experience as a Black person in America is infused with surrealism um, simply because I exist in this space. I feel like we've been, all of these questions are so interconnected, right? We can't, we're, we're, we're live at so many different intersections, right? And our writing comes to those places. The animals that Elisa writes about who, you know, have a lot of things to say and are like us and not like us, um, reflect us back to ourselves, right? Um, yeah. So that was the Afro Surrealist Manifesto, Dexter? Yes, by uh, B. Scott Miller, I believe. B. Scott Miller, thank you. What about other folks' thoughts, PFJ? Well, it's basically what I said before, that I can explore 
symbolically mistakes that have been made before, but also um, worry about mistakes that can be made in the future. It's not just problems with language, problems with custom with customs, but um, and uh, poles of political thought, but even even problems with technologies that are completely misunderstood that don't have the the same ability to commingle in a in in a safe or appropriate way and i i wonder how a lot of these things are going are going to pan out and and it worries me most, I think, that not so much that people are going to deliberately be evil, because that's easy to recognize and easy to persuade people to rise up again uh, against, but, but people do things sometimes where they absolutely mean well, and sometimes those actions are even more catastrophic, either because they weren't thought through or because the actual outcome could not be predicted. And then actually, actually, thanks for saying that because it reminded me of what I wanted to say about your comment earlier, which is that in some ways there's, um, the language of colonization is used so much in um, kind of the concepts of space and space travel. So this mission is called this. Um, and so as you were talking and you were saying that we're repeating the same things over and over again, um, part of what one of the earlier questions was asking is like, how does your work um, fight against realism, which is canonized through white Western thought. And what that makes me think of is how education um, trains us in white Western thought and white supremacy, either to support, to survive it, to thrive in it, to somehow be adjacent to it. Um, and yet your writing actually is like pushing against something else, right? Pushing against that thing. Um, and it also makes me think of in terms of like individual liberation and not making the same mistakes over and over again, like a, like how, how do we as humanity create like a self-awareness, like a global self-awareness so that you are that person in your line that's like, I'm not gonna pick fucked up unavailable people anymore to love or whatever, I'm not going to continue to harm the earth or I will no longer hold white supremacy as, as truth and I reject it in everything that I do. Like what is, is there anything in your work that you hope can give people like that tool to like not do that thing again? And that's just a, question for everyone. I'd like to think so, but I'm afraid that probably not. It's amazing what people can take away from a poem or for or from fiction that sometimes you not only didn't intend, but that it's not actually there. <laughs> yeah. I I read a story once in public about a child who discovers um, a crashed spaceship in the woods with a dead alien in it. And after I had read the story, a woman came up to me crying and thanked me and, and told me how brave I was to read that story about my stepfather molesting me. And this simply wasn't in the story and it was I've, I've always wondered what it was that, that made her interpret it that way. Yeah. Linearity doesn't work for a lot of people, for most of us. And we take kind of what we need from what we hear and what, we, what we've read, um, which actually makes me think of maybe a next question for all of you. Dexter, you, you brought in a lot of um, I heard Gwendolyn's name, Gwendolyn Brooks. So who are, who are, who gave you that, that tool to help you be where you are now? 
who are your who are your literary tool givers? I don't know if this is like a, I mean, I can give like maybe a list of writers that have like given me those tools, but I'm just gonna say my mom. I mean, <laughs> the OG like storyteller, um, the person who is like, you know, when I was thinking a lot about realism, the things that are um, also not told or silenced or, you know, hidden, um, there's like a huge part of my family's history that's just like, censored like I have no idea um like you know what happened you know to my family during the cultural revolution for instance um or the fact that you know my mom may change the story of like how she arrived in the U.S. over and over again like I mean just recently my mom just told me that she's not actually her age I'm like how old are you when is your birthday like she keeps changing it and so I think there's something about, you know, my mom as this kind of um, continual literary, uh, I don't know, uh, m you know, mode of inspiration. I think like, you know, speaking of children, um, I feel like, you know, my mom telling me stories um, all the time when I was a little kid um, really sent me down this path of creating these little worlds that I felt um, could really truly be, be possible. Um, so maybe that's kind of a, an answer to the realism question slash who are my, you know, um, I guess, you know, uh, storytellers that, you know, kind of stay with me. Um, of course, like, I love, like, Audre Lorde's work and um, Lucille Clifton um, in particular. Um, and I have always been kind of um, enamored by Jamaica Kincaid's work, too, as something that's kind of surreal. And I mean, it was like one sentence stories. I'm like, where did we just go? I just love that. Um, um, but uh, in my dream world, I feel like my mom would meet all these writers that I love and they would just like eat snacks and, and just make up stuff um, mm -hmm. to feel like they're in community um, and together. And so um, yeah, lots of aunties mostly just telling me crazy things that they made up. Um, but at the same time, they could be real. This is the thing is that I don't know actually if some of her stories are real and some of them are false. Because she told me this story about cutting up, uh, cutting this boy's foot open when she was 16 um, in school. And I thought she was making up a story. Um, and, you know, when I went to China for the first time when I was a teenager, he came wobbling out with like no toe. And so, Girl. you know, I don't know what's real, what's <laughs> surreal. I don't know anymore, but my mom, that's my answer for now. Yeah, I mean, the countryside is real gangster. Like, you you have to, you know, when my mom was young, you know, also the farm stories or like the ancestor stories. I'm like, yeah, like my brothers, we had like a, a giant rifle in the house and my brothers were playing with it and they shot me in the leg. And now there's like this giant star on her leg and that's how we know it's true but like how do you know it's true it's just because it's it's a story so maybe that makes it true yeah i like that it's kind of like if it's it becomes more real when the story is passed on and on and on and on to the next generation it's it feels like that must be the truth or that's 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 close as we can get to <laughs> to true yeah or like also repair like in my work i'm really interested in repair or changing or like trying to do the different thing with the harm that's been done, whether I was in charge of that harm or not, or part of it somehow. And so like, when we tell our own stories, when we reimagine them, when perhaps they're set in outer space, like, I feel like we're trying to, to you know, imagine that elsewhere and what else is possible in the, in the otherwise. Or like Dexter said, like, what else is there? What is the kind of joy that could be felt under these circumstances? Let's feel it, right? Um, I think my answer to that question, I, I like to move through art mediums and art genres. And so um, in terms of literary posts, I would say right now, um, Toni Morrison and Henry Dumas, um, because of how consistently in their works, they try to hold on to those stories that I was talking about, the cultural stories that have been sort of suppressed by, by white history, right? Um, but I'm also really inspired by visual art. And one of the visual artists who most inspired my work is uh, Kahindi Wiley. Um, who does a lot of paintings where he'll go out on the streets of the city and he'll find black people and say, hey, do you want to model for me? And he lets them pick out their own like classical background, paisley patterns, whatever. And he puts them in the positions of these classical paintings. And he recreates these classical paintings with um, people who are black. 
and seeing his work really made me feel like like it's one thing to read a book and to see yourself in a book to see yourself in pages it's another thing to see yourself like visually in the art world like he he went to my hometown of richmond virginia recently and he did this sculpture where he has a black man on a horse um and it's representative it's reflecting monument avenue which is in virginia which is this like series of blocks that's just confederate statues right and so to see someone put a black person in that position um i think did a lot for my my writing for me thinking like what can i do how can i how can i make it so that other people who look like me see themselves and that was that was a huge deal for me absolutely i can feel that the seeing the seeing of ourselves in the material world and in, in art yeah hindu wiley's work is really beautiful yeah, do think, our other yes elisa i think most writers are magpies I mean, I see shiny things uh, and, and pick them up. Um, my mom grew up milking a cow named Reverse because it would always back up. And so, you know, that's, that's the way you think about animals is some sort of logical association with their behavior. And I actually started writing the first story in my collection. I was really stuck and I heard about a, a mountain lion that got into somebody's house. And it, and it seemed like kind of a sexy story, but I didn't really know how to tell it. Um, and so I started writing it as a long poem. I wrote it as a poem with a really long line in eight stanzas. And then I just clawed it back into prose. But I was reading a lot of Philip Levine. I was reading some C.K. Williams at the time who, you know, I don't necessarily always love them, but the, the rhythm of their writing really helped me solve some writing problems. So, so yeah, shiny things. We're lucky. Yes. And also what a genre. Whatever. <laughs> okay. FJ, do you go between, do you use other genres to help you get into your storytelling or what you need to say or other artworks? Oh yes. I, I do a lot of ekphrastic work. Uh, there's a, a, a local uh, painter, uh, Kelly Hopman, um, whose work is really wonderful and we've collaborated on uh, on a couple of books as well as individual poems and she she's illustrated my poems and i've written poems about her paintings so it works both ways oh. i had a lot of um science classes when i was uh going to university and I, I, I still try to read in the sciences and draw on some of those things. The part about, in, in one of the poems that I read about, about teaching in the, in the closet and pretending to have an affair so that no one would know, um, that came from a story that um, my genetics professor told me about a guy who was teaching in Russia while Lysenko was in power, who believed that, that acquired traits were inheritable. And he was teaching his students in the janitor's closets that no one would know that he was teaching them stuff that went against um, the official government position. To say nothing of, uh, of, of uh, the governor of Florida making it illegal for state employees to say anything about climate change. But I, I try to, um, what, 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 what Elisa said about being a magpie, absolutely. I, I think one of the most important influences on my writing is in fact uh, Steve Martin when he was a comedian. Yeah, I'm a Margaret Cho fan. <laughs> Pretty hard <laughs> myself. But yes, of course, like artists, just like all of us people, we all are influenced and shaped by the songs we heard growing up, by the things we watched or didn't watch. Um, or didn't watch, rather. But yeah, thank you all for your, your answers and for this really amazing round table. I wish we could be here another two days talking about um, how to use the otherwise to be free and to live and joy in our bodies. Um, but the time has come for some questions from our audience members. And um, 
Tisha, did you do you have instruction about how to use that for folks who maybe haven't used it? Do you just click on it? It's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, okay. Next to the chat button, it should say just Q&A. And if you click in there, you should be able to type a question right in. Vicki, if you click on it, your box will pop up and you'll be able to see their questions. In to read them? Okay. Uh -huh. Here comes my finger again. Sorry. Anybody in the, uh, any of the participants, any of the attendees have questions, you can put those right in the Q&A um, for any of the readers or Vicki. Yeah. Thoughts, things that you're thinking about. Jane, you're totally right about like who are the who are your literary influences. It's like uh, my mom, whose earrings I'm wearing, like my uncle from the country who like writes rhyming poems to this day. Like, yeah, they're everywhere. I know there are a lot of poets on this list. Okay, let's see. Interesting. Um, so this question is from Lisa Rivera. Thank you for this wonderful experience, just this, uh, they say. Um, my question is for Dexter, and they ask, where can I read more about laughing barrels? Um, makes me think of maybe doing a Google search for that, but if you've got other texts in particular, Dexter, that would be great. And then have you heard about the talking book? And this question is for Dexter. Um, I have heard about the talking book. To answer the question about the laughing barrel, uh, the best I can say is, Google or JSTOR. Um, it's, not, it's not information that is readily known. My, my dissertation to my PhD was specifically about finding the stories that don't get as much attention, that don't have books written about them. And so I did a lot of like digging through um, scholarly journal sites to try to find information. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think we got the internet when I was still in college and I was like, oh wow, what's this thing? Called the internet. Um, okay, this question is for FJ, but also for everyone. Just wondering, does the UFO poem factor into first contact literature for you? And if so, does an imagined first contact help you think about the historical first contacts that are already written? Well, the only first contacts that I, I recognize are, of course, um, first contacts between human cultures. To the best of my knowledge, we have not actually uh, experienced first contact with an alien culture, uh, a non-human culture, regardless of what anyone may think. Um, that poem in some ways makes fun of people who are UFO true believers, but it also, um, enters the the realm of and when when these aliens do arrive how do we interact with them and we can't even um reliably translate or interpret all the human languages that exist how on earth are we going to um understand what aliens are trying to tell us or ask us um so I, I did bring a lot of the historical human errors in, into the book. The UFO poem is, is, not, is not one of those. Thank you, FJ. And I mean, just like first contact, I mean, like the first thing I think of, I'm like, oh yeah, like that dummy Columbus. I mean, <laughs> I just think of so many. Um, current applications for that, right? Like the concept of um, immigrants and refugees as aliens, right? Like these are not metaphors, we're like in them, we live them all the time. Yeah. Other folks, I know there's a lot of poets on this. I'm looking at you, poets. And we have okay feelings. If I, if I chime back in about my Please, yes. or something, um, there's one book that I remember. Um, it's called Drums and Shadows. And it's uh, an excerpt from the Federal Writers Project. And there are um, interviews with uh, slaves and um, former slaves in the South and Georgia. And in that book, there's some slaves who also talk about the Latin barrel as well. Guns and Shadows. 
Drums and Shadows. Drums and Shadows. Yeah. Thank you, Dexter. Other books, other thoughts. Ah, <gasps> Oliver. Hi, Oliver. Um, <laughs> what? Oliver asks, what surface other than paper would you like, would you most like to write on? Good question, Oliver. What surface other than paper would you most like to write on? I love a newsprint. And then that's all Juan Felipe Herrera's fault right there, let me tell you. I'm going to say canvas. Um, there are lots of like paint markers and things and I oftentimes will like write uh, my poems like on canvas with paint marker as opposed to paper. Yeah. How does it feel? What do you have to do to, yeah, what, what happened? <laughs> the, the markers are and um, they're like these little tubes and you have a ball in them and the, I think the paint is like dry and the ball like activates the paint but there's something like visceral about like um, painting words as opposed to like handwriting them and it's just a different mm -hmm. like uh, mind body experience that happens for me. I do that. It takes longer, right? Like there's more the, yeah. stroke, the gesture, uh -huh. yeah. other processing. How about other folks? What other surface than, other than paper would you like to write on? I like the yeah. idea of ephemeral. Oh. Sorry, Go ahead. Um, I, like, I like the idea of, of ephemeral surfaces of um, using water on stone for or or water um on on dirt uh writing in mud something that will be destroyed um the next with the next heavy rain but the idea of 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 planting um uh flowers or vegetables in the shape of words or mowing a lawn uh into letters is is really appealing and i have I, I have to confess, um, uh, it, as a project in a typography class, I'm, I made a, a cookie cutter in the shape of letters and, and brought in chocolate chip cookies and got an A for that one. <laughs> yeah, you get an A for me for that. That's a great idea. <laughs> Jane, what were you gonna say? Um, I was actually, that's funny that you mentioned that FJ because I was going to say something with food because um, I, and Dexter too, when you're talking about like visual art, I had this um, visual art sculptural show at the Fry Art Museum, uh, I guess last year. And you know, when you're brainstorming things for things that you, I personally don't have experience making sculptural poems. It was the first time I ever did anything like that. Um, and I ended up, you know, putting a bunch of poems um, on a, in, inside of like, you know, restaurant bowls and a giant table. Like I grew up in a restaurant. Um, but one idea that I didn't do because they thought it was too, uh, well, impossible <laughs> um, was to, um, you know, there are these Chinese noodles that are like longevity noodles. They're just like super long, like one giant noodle, like so long that it could wrap around an, an entire like room and that I would, you know, write the poem on the, the noodle. Um, and then it would have this like floppy, dusty, I don't know, quality to it. And the idea, I know it's not possible, but the imagining like slurping up that giant, like one noodle poem, I think like would be a dream of mine. So um, thank you, Oliver, for that question, because I've actually been thinking about this. And when I told the people at the Fry, they're like, um, <laughs> I also wanted an inflatable, you know, when you have those, uh, you know, inflatable swans, you know, when you go swimming or whatever. Oh, yeah. I wanted an inflatable pork bun. Cause, yes. Yeah, I wanted a pool that just had a giant pork bun in it. And that, yeah. like, you, yeah, and that, that could be a poem. Um, anyway, I, I, I think... I don't know. One day, I think I'd like to 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 do it and to to write on a giant noodle. And that's totally possible. I I am with you. I want to help you figure that out. <laughs> also, there's um uh eh, le, the fideos. So in like Mexican grocery stores, you can buy the bag of letters. I mean, that's like they're noodles, but they're letters already. So you can spell shit in your spoon. So oh, anyway. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm with you. Food writing. Love Next it. level food writing. I would, um, like, I would like to eat an entire book of poetry 
uh, written with noodles and some maybe some black bean sauce. So I think that should be our next. Our somebody, next. Pub somebody published a book where each page is a slice of American cheese. That's so appropriate for so many reasons. <laughs> like, yeah, I love it. I eat those through like plastic, P.S. That's a fun way to eat it. Tisha also said writing on glass with marker is amazing. Um, I have a few friends on this viewing this who also like to do that. And then I wanna mention In Plain Sight, um, which is um, In Plain Sight Map, which is at their in Instagram handle is at In Plain Sight Map, which was, um, a project to end immigrant detection now it was uh had a lot of different artists and then they collaborated to create sky writing right so um free them all over the sky in los angeles and new york and well and everywhere there were detention centers so um look up um at in plain sight map to learn more about that project and with that we are at time unless there was one more question no hay más preguntas did I miss anyone? All right, so now I am gonna turn it over to Laura Roque, but first I wanna thank our panelists. I wanna thank all the folks who asked questions, everyone who's listening, wherever you are. I hope you're safe, I hope you're happy. Have a beautiful Sunday. Laura. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you very much for inviting me. This was lovely. Hi everyone. So yeah, so thank you to all the attendees for joining us for the third and final installment of our two by two reading series, Writing the Surreal. Thank you, Vicki, again, for leading us this evening. Thank you to Elisa Slaughter, FJ Bergman, Jane Wong, and Dexter Booth for being part of the Gold Line and Ricochet community and reading amazing surrealist work that complicates form um, and goes beyond the confines of normative texts. So as a tradition, we'd like to take a group photo after our events. Tisha, are you on selfie duty? I am ready as soon as I see everyone's faces. I feel like these weird like rays of sun on my face, but I'm gonna have to. It's very 80s. I mean, <laughs> very Corey Hart. Like I wear my sunglasses at night. Don't get ready. <laughs> I'm clean your muscles. Go to staff. Clean your muscles. Because my thing just closed. I'm opening it again. Sorry. Also, right. when you are old, things take a while on the computer. Yeah. I had it all ready to go, and then it said, "Just kidding. You can't play right now." Uh, okay. Everybody's ready. Everybody's camera's ready. Okay, let me make sure my mouth's not wide open and talking. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> you can talk now. Also, okay. shout out to Muriel Leon for, for like reaching out. Yeah. So we hope that you continue to support our readers' work beyond this event by purchasing their books and following them on social media to stay up to date on next events. Please see the links in our chat box for more information. You can follow Goldline Press and Ricochet Editions on social media to stay up to date on our next events and programming. While Ricochet Editions reading period has recently concluded, please follow the press on social media to see what editors are reading these days and other fun news. If you sent in work during the call for submissions, Ricochet Editions is so thankful for your manuscript and we look forward to reading you. In the meantime, the reading period for Golden Line Press's 2020 chapbook contest in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry comes to a close today. Uh, get your manuscripts in if you haven't already. Golden yeah. Line Press, yeah. And I put, the link Press. In the chat. I put the link in the chat. Sorry, Laura. No, oh, interrupting me. <laughs> Golden Line Press and Ricochet's two by two reading series brings together authors from both our astounding catalogs in conversation with writers we admire from our surrounding literary community. Thank you again to Vicky, Elisa, FJ, Jane, and Dexter for making our third reading so exceptional. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us today. Please stay tuned for the video of this event on YouTube and share with those who couldn't make it today. Thank you. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going into the social medias to follow all of you if you're there. There you are, Dexter. Thanks right. everyone. Thanks for your work. Hi, David Yulin. Hey Vicky, how are you? That was wonderful. Thanks for doing it. You know, Mas. <laughs>